Hello. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar run by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, my name is Dr Norman Poole. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the BGS Inc Bulletin and a consultant psychiatrist working in South London. Um, so I'll be chairing today's session, which is on magical thinking, moral and moral injury, exclusion culture and psychiatry. This is a paper written by um, Dr. Chloe Beal, and it's uh, been a very um, powerfully received paper, actually. Uh, I was just before this looked at the altmetric score, which is the sort of score of um, how engaged uh, the readership is with the paper and its current score is 495 whereas normally our scores are sort of uh, somewhere around the 10 mark so you can see that that is a it's a, a, a very well read and engaged um, with paper it's actually in the top five percent of all research papers being read in the around the world at the moment and it's got readership from Ecuador to Estonia, Malaysia, Japan, um, Australia, Canada, and of course, um, most mainly in the UK. Um, so Chloe's paper is, is an excellent example, actually, of what I really wanted to try and do with the bulletin. I think the bulletin is a great vehicle for um, being able to talk about the culture of psychiatry, the impact of psychiatry on society and, and, and also societies impact on psychiatry um, uh, and, and, and really um, this was a sort of something that I, I really wanted to take forward under my editorship. David Foreman, um, the editor of that section, commissioned the paper from Chloe um, and we'll, we'll find out a little bit about that, um, about that shortly. Now, today I'm going to be going through a few questions, so I, I get the chair's prerogative to ask a few questions to begin with, but then there's been so many people have joined uh, this, um, this webinar. I mean, we, we've had over 1,500 registrants uh, to, the, to this afternoon's webinar, so I, I, I'm going to hand over to you guys uh, at some stage soon uh, as well, so I won't be taking up all of the time with my own questions. We've also assembled a, some panellists um, for the discussion today. So we've got Debbie Francis. Um, Debbie is a carer to her daughter who has a history um, of quite serious mental health problems and uh, complex emotional needs. Um, Debbie's also a carer and an educator um, and is involved with the University of Exeter. Also joining us is Professor uh, Subod uh, Davi. Um, uh, Subod is uh, the Dean of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, a consultant um, in Derbyshire Healthcare Foundation Trust and also a, a, a professor of um, psychiatry and I think he's well known to lots of people for his engagement um, in medical education and also trying to improve services and, and, co and collaborate really with patients and carers to improve services. Last not not least, in fact, the star of the show is Dr. Uh, Chloe Beale, who is a consultant uh, liaison psychiatrist at Homerton, which is my local hospital. So I know if I ever become unwell, I'll be well cared for, hopefully. Um, and uh, in addition, she's the clinical lead um, and uh, is is also on the uh, faculty of liaison psychiatry, um, uh, a member of that and, and their patient safety group. OK, so that's enough from me at the minute. Um, Chloe, your, your criticisms are, are quite wide ranging. I, I was hoping you could maybe summarise the paper for us and, and make your sort of three key points that you'd really like the audience to take away from your paper. Thank you. Um, yeah, your, your criticisms are quite wide ranging. I think that that's that possibly the title of my autobiography. Um, uh, so it's in brief, it's an article about the many insidious ways in which mental health services um, at an organizational and an individual le level have um, excused the exclusion of people from care. Um, and I think it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's difficult to completely summarize. And, and I know that people are asking for a link to the paper, which I'm sure we can share. Um, okay. Otherwise, probably not much of what I'm talking about will make a lot of sense. Um, but I think that my three key points really I think the paper for me was a bit of a call to arms um and it's been really interesting how much the reaction that I've had has been has been positive and people saying thank you for writing this thank god you've said it lots and lots of agreement um 
And I think, yeah, in terms of three key points and, and things that I'd like people to take away from it, I think one would be that we need to be honest um, as clinicians and as leaders, be honest in consultations with individual patients, but also at senior level um, about why people are being de denied care and stop pretending that there are actually good clinical reasons and evidence for what we're doing. Um, Another takeaway point, I think, would be for all of us as clinicians and working in services to watch our language, um, which, again, seems like an odd thing to to say. As those who, who work with me will know that I use swearing effectively as a form of punctuation and I'm regularly tone policed um, for, for speaking too harshly. Um, but actually, I think the language is really important and the, the way we the way we say things and and sometimes the, the comeback to that when I talk about the language of exclusion and the words we use in psychiatry and why they're important often the comeback is you know well things will just be replaced with something else um and um you know it's not the words that are the problem and, and of course it's not the words that are the problem um but i think that's starting to pay attention to the meaning of the things that we say things like things i talk about in the paper things like gatekeeping and the language of risk for example um i think that draws our attention to what's underlying it um and makes us start to ask difficult questions about our practices and um you know and hopefully ultimately start to change um and then I think finally, a lot of the paper is about risk, and that's something that I'm very interested in. Um, I'm very interested in, in suicide and patient safety, um, and very frustrated by our obsession in mental health with, with risk or false ideas about risk. Um, and I think a message that I would like to convey is that I don't think that we're patient centered. I think that when we think about who we're protecting, ultimately what we're increasingly doing is trying to protect ourselves rather than patients. And that's what's behind a lot of the exclusion. Um, and there's various things that we're protecting ourselves from, but I think that we've, we've built this sort of fortress of a system where we protect ourselves from the patients who we see as unwelcome invaders. And you can see that in the language of gatekeeping and protecting beds and, and all of that sort of thing. So I think that's my uh, extremely long winded three take home points. Apologies for going on a bit. No problem. Um, thank you for that. And I, I mean, I was sort of wondering when I was reading it because because it is an angry paper um, and I was just wondering was there an event that triggered the actual writing of it or was it just a sort of accumulation of frustrations? Um, I don't think that I'm, the, the pandemic didn't help. Um, I think it was a it was a, a you know a combination of things. I think that I'm a pretty angry person and working in mental health services, you know, makes one angry. Perhaps particularly being a liaison psychiatrist, mainly working in emergency department, um, I feel like I'm constantly facing this problem of trying to make referrals and everything being rejected and sort of sitting at the interface with every other service and seeing all of the exclusion criteria and the rejection all around me. Um, so it was a culmination of things, but actually, in a, in a strange sort of way, as you said, David Foreman very kindly commissioned the paper. And there was something about the pandemic which has been really good in terms of widening access and giving people a platform which they haven't previously had. I started to get quite active on Twitter during lockdown, the pandemic, and and actually just that platform and interacting with different people and just, you know, because I'm, I'm a nobody. I'm not some <laughs> academic. I'm not an innovator, I'm not a prize winner, I'm just a garden variety psychiatrist with a load of opinions, but I haven't achieved anything spectacular in my career. So I'm not the sort of person that gets invited to write papers or speak at conferences usually. But over the last couple of years, just sort of doing opinions on Twitter um, and interacting with people and widening my network and speaking to like-minded individuals and then get invited to speak on the basis of that, kind of led to a talk that I was giving that you know brought my mouthing off to David's attention and um you know he invited me to write the paper so it's been 
is a really uh, it kind of a nice example of the way the how everything's got sort of gone online has sort of flattened hierarchies and and widened the access of of those to, to certain fora that we might not have had before if that makes sense yeah so thank you and De debbie and Subo, I, I, i'm wondering from your perspective why do you think this paper has struck such a chord and um uh, chloe mentioned social media i must admit i'm not right trying to avoid social media i mean I, I think it's been impactful there can you sort of tell us a bit about its impact there maybe debbie first okay thank you um so i'm not a, a big one to be on social media to be honest so it's hard for me to comment about its impact there but from a carer perspective and i guess in some way representing lived experience generally um, you know, to have someone within psychiatry writing fundamentally what I've been feeling about the system and what so many people with lived experience have been experiencing of the system and feeling about the system. Um, you know, for me, it's a breath of fresh air to have someone within the system recognising some of the challenges, some of the weaknesses in the system that affect you know, carers, patients, and clinicians themselves. So I think uh, for me, I, I you know, just want to hug Chloe really for writing it because it's um, it's lovely to to feel like there's an ally within the system who's also recognising that it isn't working and that there are challenges that we need to be addressing and we need to be delivering services in a different way and having different attitudes towards patients, carers. And all those who are who are struggling to navigate the system. So I think it, it has it has touched people and resonated with people, uh, and I think that alone has has you know sent ripples out. Um, and it and it and it's good to feel that so many people are are responding to the paper positively. That it's creating conversation and discussion that's so badly needed in order to bring people together to achieve change rather than us all fighting mm. um you know separately and achieving nothing fundamentally so i think from my perspective that's why um why it's had such an impact yeah thank you uh Subo. thanks um well i mean i think you know as you can see in the chat and everywhere else i think it's, it's really touched um, a nerve with people isn't it it's really resonated very well i think for me i think two things i think i think um, chloe used the word insidious and i think i i really genuinely feel that's that's so such a thing i think such an important uh, thing i think a few years ago i i remember discussing mandatory training in a group of you know consultants and educators and um and the question of you know trainees coming onto the inpatient ward without knowing fully how to use antipsychotics came up and yet having to go through training that taught them everything about credit forward and manual uh, handling etc and and what worried me most was there were some fairly senior people saying that, well, this is something that the National Patient Safety Agency has asked us to do. We don't have and we, we can't do anything about it. And I think that's exactly what you, I think to me, that, that's what it resonated with me, that, that that's what happens. We, we say, well, this is beyond my control. I can't do anything about it. And and I think that disempowerment is something I really feel is 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 so corrosive, you know, it's so genuinely corrosive. And I think, and it's divisive, you know, and I think it, it creates exactly the kind of, um, and then, you know, when you add that on top of the power differential that already exists between patients and doctors, um, I think it, it, it's, it's deeply damaging, you know, for, for all parties concerned. And, and I think, which is why it, it goes to the heart of many, many issues, I think, uh, about the system of medicine, about the system of psychiatry, not just psychiatry, though I feel it is true of the system of medicine. Um, so I think that was one thing. And the second thing I think, um, which comes across uh, very strongly in your paper is, is that whole idea around, um, you know, co-production and, 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 and I feel that, that for me, I think particularly it touched me quite a lot because it's something I've learned over, over a period of time. I think when I started, um, when I founded a group at the college, I called the group, um, Jed Boardman and I co-founded it. And, you know, we had a group bunch of patients with lived experience, carers, even doctors with lived experience of mental illness joined the group. Um, and we, I, I called it patient-centered care initially. And I think uh, soon I was challenged about it. And I think we moved to person-centered care. And I feel it was, a, you know, I think I would have been one arguing that these are semantic differences and it 
what's the difference between patient and, and person? Are we paying too much of it, et cetera? But I think it does matter, you know, I think it, it does matter as to what, how, how does, when a patient comes to us, I think even if you are very patient-centered, your whole approach is very much in the service of the diagnosis, in service of the treatment plan, in service of almost a system that you're working in. And I think that's exactly, I think, where even some of us who are very compassionate and want to work in, end up in that space. But I think if you're person-centered care, then sometimes you're forced to kind of challenge the system. You recognize the system is actually not working. And I think and I, I think that that is the space we, where most of us want to be in. I think that's the space where we, we started, uh, you know, we came to psychiatry in, in medicine to, 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 to do that. And I think that's why you're seeing such a, such a phenomenal response to your paper and then well done on writing that. And I think the good, good thing from my point of view is that it's, it's, it's brought people together because I genuinely feel that, that a good outcome of this will be if we, we can collaborate and then move things forward. So thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, um, Chloe, you mentioned suicide and risk assessment um, in, in the summary of the paper, and I mean that that, that clearly is quite a focus of it. Um, and you say that you know that that uh, we seem to pay heed to neither scientific evidence nor personal testimony um, when sort of reviewing and thinking about its value. I suppose in in the paper, and I might have been wrong, but it sort of felt like you were kind of blaming the clinicians, um, whereas we're sort of being told to do these risk assessments. And actually most, I think, clinicians think that risk assessment's not all that great. So is the blame on the clinician that we're not resistant enough to these things? Um, and uh, but, but at the same time, it sort of feels like it, the system is being allowed to drive this and you're sort of blaming the, blaming the victim a little bit. We're just following orders, are we? Um, I think it's both, you know, I think that, um, you know, actually, I mean, you say that most clinicians know this, but I sort of think, well, do most clinicians know this? Because, uh, you know, I don't think the college CASC exam reflects the fact that we know that risk assessments have serious limitations, in all honesty. I think that we, you know, at an organisational level are teaching individuals about this. I think that the fact that every single clerking, you know, most ward round entries that I see in patients' notes contain a section on risk in which it's quantified into low, medium, high. So I don't know that we do all know this, but also I think that, yeah, I mean, of, course, of course there's both. And I think there's a huge amount of organizational responsibility and not just at trust level, but further to that, because we are, we're responding to pressure from CQC and the coronial service. And I apologize that I realize I'm only actually speaking from experience of working in England and, and it's not the same in devolved nations and elsewhere. Um, but I think that if we, to say that there's no individual responsibility just sort of conveys powerlessness and then it means that we don't need to change because it's outside of our control. Um, and that's, you know, it's not, we, we can do something about this. It's, you know, it's a cop out because also talking about our own powerlessness as clinicians, well, do you know who has the least power here is the patients. Um, and I think that I suspect that patients and carers have some sympathy for the, the things that we're facing, but I suspect, and, you know, Debbie can speak to this better than I can, but I suspect people are fed up with us saying that we haven't got any power and it's out of our hands and it's the organizational responsibility. You know, I, I'm sort of actually slightly tired of the, you know, of the, I suppose, need to pander to sensibilities. You know, I'm sort of tired of, you know, it's not all clinicians. I'm not interested in that any more than I'm interested in not all men or all lives matter. Do you know what I mean? It's, I think individuals can mobilise to form, you know, to form groups and to, and to have power. And I think that, oppressive systems succeed because individuals say well I haven't got any power and it's and it's not you know it's I'm, I'm, like I said there's nothing special about me but I'm here questioning in it and not doing you know, not quantifying risk and arguing that risk assessments are pointless or checklists are pointless so I don't think it's helpful to say that it's in that it's that it's not about individuals I think we've we've all from whatever point in the food chain you are, whether you're, you know, a student nurse up to chief exec, you know, I think we've all got a role and some degree of power to change things. Yeah. 
I don't, Debbie or Subod, do you have any thoughts on? Uh... I mean, just yeah, if I could come back. I mean, I think I think I agree with you, Chloe. I mean, I think I, you know, I think some some of you may have seen me speak out against racism on 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 Channel Four a while ago, and I think um, I think another point you make, Chloe, quite quite explicitly in the paper is that the burden of fighting that um, you know um, oppression shouldn't fall on the people who are the victims of that oppression, and I think. And I think so clearly, I think you're absolutely right in saying that, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, you know, and I mentioned that the power differential exists. And I think for me, I think that that is, uh, you know, exists between clinician and, and patients. And I think that's something so, so to expect um, to let clinicians off the hook completely wouldn't be right. And I also feel that you're right, perhaps, that there is perhaps a knowledge gap there as much as an attitude gap and this thing, because I, and I feel that medical education broadly, I think, and again, I, I, I'm not letting psychiatry off the hook here, but I think, I think medical education has, has, has been taught in a particular way where we don't really see the person as a whole. We don't really see, and I think, you know, the whole idea of te teaching doctors in a way that well, will teach you assessment, pathology, investigations, treatment, you know, and I think, I think widening it, but I think, I think, I think times are changing now. I think, you know, I've, I've been having conversations with many colleagues and we all acknowledge that the wider context matters. It's not just about the doctor patient, the doctor community relationship matters, understanding, um, you know, what causes those inequalities, um, you know, whether it be due to ethnicity or whether it be due to the doctor patient uh, power differential. And I think we have, we have put that those things in our curriculum now. So our new curriculum actually, taught, one of the capabilities is about teaching and learning, they re, what, what can the power differential do to, to your clinical decision-making? What can it do to your, uh, how does it impact on the outcomes of patients? And I think, so I do feel, I agree with you that there are some knowledge gaps. And then I think, I think we as clinicians and, you know, I, in my position as the Dean of the, of the college, I need to take responsibility for, for trying to fix some of this. And I don't think that, you know, I would be looking at it elsewhere, but having said that, I think it's a collaborative effort. And I think what doesn't help is to kind of have an adversarial process, you know, I think, uh, and I genuinely want to work with, um, with, with, with uh, patients and carers and other, other stakeholders to kind of really try and solve this as much as we can. I wondered what Debbie makes of risk assessment, because uh, I mean, in many ways, it sort of, it, it developed actually, because psychiatrists weren't sort of, you know, it, 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 well, it was to protect patients and to protect carers. And, you know, there was this, this idea that actually people of high risk could be predicted. Um, and we can argue about that, but I just wonder what Debbie makes of risk assessment and the process of it and, you know, your involvement in it. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's nothing per se wrong with assessing somebody's risk. I think it's a question of why it's being done and who it's being done for and what happens when you assess that risk. And I don't think it's possible to reduce such things as suicidality to a tick box exercise. I mean, my daughter has attempted suicide on many occasions and lives with chronic suicidality. Um, she always has a plan um, and yet she lives a good life uh, from you know periods of time of stability and um, you know I don't think you can you can judge uh, risk just by ticking boxes on a chart. You need to get to understand somebody's um, you know the, the environment, their social aspect, cultural aspects, all the other parts that feed into what might be affecting somebody's mental well-being. Um, and you're not going to do that if all you're looking at is to try and categorize risk in some way to be able to either say, yes, this person needs more care or no, this person can go away um, fundamentally and take their own chances. And I think, you know, I think it's it's how it is done. It's not really about the conversations about risk, because Actually, in my experience for my daughter is that inpatient admissions have been the absolute worst thing ever for her. And yet they have been deemed to be appropriate for her at certain times and yet have often made her risk much higher because the more disempowered she feels, the more control that's taken from her, the more her liberty is restricted, the more desperate in many respects she, she becomes. So. I think we've got to be looking at the whole system really about what does it mean? What does it even mean when we risk assess and say that someone has high levels of risk and, and what does that person need to happen? Why are we not having these conversations about what that means to somebody? Because 
what it might mean to somebody from a clinical perspective could be completely different from how it, it mean how it is for someone living with that level of risk, mm. how it is for carers to help manage that risk, which often carers are expected to do with no training, um, no support, no information, and often very little, if any, interaction with the clinicians um, who are supporting or um, helping the person that they're caring for. So, you know, I, I, I hear that there's a, <laughs> I mean, my longing is for collaboration, for co-production, um, because I think that's the only way we can actually really um, manage risk in a more constructive way rather than just assuming that if someone's high risk we need to put them in an inpatient unit um, which does not fundamentally necessarily help in my experience and I know many people not just my daughter many people who have had inpatient admissions or carers of those who have had inpatient admissions I have never yet heard anyone say that it was because of that inpatient admission that things have improved I'm not saying that it's never useful to have an inpatient admission because a short admission can be helpful. But my daughter was inpatient for three and a half years. And for all of that time, she was out of area in various parts of the country. You can't ever tell me um, that that was that was a good way to manage her level of risk because all it did was make her increasingly more and more desperate. So I think it's about being honest about what do you mean about a risk assessment and and who are you assessing that risk for so i think you know there's a, a that sort of in the the paper of saying that that there is this information in abundance about um you know about risk about what patients want about what carers want i feel frustrated that it takes someone within services for chloe to have written this paper for suddenly everyone to go oh, yes we really need to talk about this. It's like patients have been telling you this stuff for years. Carers have been shouting about this for years. Um, and I also, like Chloe, have been told that I can be too outspoken or very forthright. It's like, yeah, I need to be forthright because actually I want other people to stand up. I think it's too easy to hide behind. Yes, of course, the system doesn't serve anybody. As I said right at the beginning, I don't think the system serves anybody. But um, the people at the bottom, the patients and their carers have no power whatsoever. And I think if we are really going to be looking at what's right for patients, we need to be looking at recovery principles and helping people to be empowered, to make decisions, to take some level of control in, in their care, in the decisions about what they want to happen to them. That's about how you manage risk. You don't manage it by telling someone that that they either need to be in hospital or that they're fine. And it's like there's this, you know, <laughs> these polar opposites and there's all this grey area in the middle where so many people fall through the net. And yet we're not having conversations, real conversations with people about what they need in order to stay safe. That's a risk assessment as far as I'm concerned, not something that excludes families and fundamentally, most of the time, excludes patients themselves and decisions are made and things done to them. Um, and we need to move beyond that. And that is both the system and individual clinicians and everybody can stand up and challenge and everyone can be a leader, um, you know, and to, to just say, well, you know, the system doesn't work. No, absolutely, it doesn't work. So what are we going to do about it? I mean, I think if I understand uh, Chloe correctly, I think, Chloe, you're saying that risk is set, we cannot predict risk and therefore it's a, a redundant exercise. So in a sense, I mean, I, I guess that to me, I wonder if is quite a challenge to patients and carers to hear actually we're going to not be doing this thing because it doesn't work, which also means actually we are, we're, we're acknowledging that actually things are going to be risky and that we can't manage that because we can't predict it. Well, I think that's where it comes down to to honesty and that's why I talk about honesty because it's not it's not about not acknowledging risk in any way or not trying to help people manage risk in any way and actually sort of separate to that 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 really is something that's in the pipeline at the moment that's something that that is a piece of work that is going on um about how we sort of reduce this reliance on on, on evidence risk assessments 
um, and move sort of towards uh, safety planning, although obviously the anxiety about safety planning is that that will just become a different set of tick boxes that doesn't actually help anybody. But if you leave aside the question of risk, you can you cover all of the same things in an assessment. But if you're if you're taking a holistic approach and finding out about a person and everything that's gone on for them and what's happening for them in their life right now, you can cover all that stuff without even needing to write the word risk in all honesty. But I think what we've done is we got to this point where we feel that the only acceptable way to manage risk is either to pretend it doesn't exist so that if something terrible happens in the future, we can say, well, I didn't see this. So we quantify it as low so we can justify our decisions um, when actually no, we, we can't predict that. But I think what we should be doing is acknowledging risk and saying, yes, there is risk here. This is what I think the risk is at the moment. Is there something going on in this person's life at the moment, which means that that particular risk is raised above baseline? Or, you know, is there something particularly acute at the moment? What's happening for that person right now in their life? And like, you know, as, as Debbie explained, someone like Debbie's daughter will lives with this, you know, in a, in a sort of really long term way. And so we either pretend that that risk isn't there, like, yes, of course, this person has been living with suicidality for years and has attempted suicide, but we're going to say that the patient's low risk, otherwise we'd have to do something. Well, it's not that it, it's low risk, it, there is risk, that risk is there, but it's about how are we going to work with that, so name it, acknowledge it, um, and say what we're going to do to support that person. So it's, it's, it's honesty yet again, it's not pretending that we know that we can see into the future or that we're making such a decision because someone's low risk. Um, and that's, that's what it, and that's what it all comes down to. So risk is just an example of this is how we exclude people because of the fantasy, the magical thinking that we tell ourselves about why we're doing it. You know, Oh, I'm not denying this person care for spurious reasons. There's really good clinical, you know, there's really good evidence to suggest that telling somebody that they you know, have to completely get on top of all of their alcohol problems before being ex able to access secondary care mental health services. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's really makes sense rather than saying, look, they're not gonna offer you this. Sorry, I'm th I think I'm being inarticulate, but it's, it's part of this whole thing that we're lying to ourselves mm -hmm. to justify our decisions. Why pretend risk doesn't exist? Of course it exists. It exists for every one of us every day. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's more that we need to, I suppose like, it's the thing about is, is risk actually predictable? It's not that risk doesn't exist. It's actually whether whether it's measurable and predictable. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you do talk a lot about exclusion. And I guess one of the themes of that is, is really how services have been divided up. I mean, when I started in psychiatry, you had a community mental health team and a consultant ran the inpatient ward and the community. And now we have all these different teams which all have their own assessment processes and referral criteria. Maybe this is for Subod. I think you've been about a little bit longer than I have, not much probably. Um, just, uh, how did this come about? And I mean, it seems, is it that it serves psychiatrists well, or have we been naive and complicit in this? I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not, just not sure. Unknown caller. Um, I mean, I, 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 I think I take a slightly broader view, you know, I, I, I feel that Inherently, health systems are complex. I think we need to acknowledge that. You know, that there is, I think, you know, I think at an individual interaction level, things, uh, um, you know, I think I can, I, I hope that most clinicians feel and will retain that sense of empowerment, you know, I think, because we came into medicine, we come to psychiatry thinking we can make a difference. But I think in large health systems, I think it's easy to feel that you are such a small cog that you can't really make a difference. You know, I mean, um, you know, we, we've known for four decades the impact of, poor housing on people's mental health. And, you know, when you see someone who's now forced to be, you know, I, I was discussing this, you know, that, you know, I've written so many letters to people about uh, the bedroom tax, you know, um, uh, no, no psychiatrists were being paid for it. And a lot of my colleagues were writing letters for their patients and, and people were being driven to, you know, despair. And there were people who were actually threatening to harm themselves, you know, becoming so unwell. Now, it's easy for people then to feel that, well, what can I do? I mean, how many letters can I write and how would that make a difference? How, how can I? So I, I guess the sense of 
it's easy to kind of, you know, in complex health systems for that to happen. And I think, um, and, and, and I also feel that in individual areas, different kinds of systems will evolve. And I think that is probably fair and right. I don't think that it, it would be right for us to say that there's only one model of healthcare or, or system that, that needs to work everywhere else. So I feel it's less about that. I think, I think to me, I think the, the overarching message, and even I know we've talked a lot about risk today, but I think to me, the overarching message is that 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 gradual, you know, uh, decimation of that sense of power, and then the fact that you can make a difference. And I think, and I find that, and for me, worryingly, I feel that that seems to be happening sooner and sooner. Now, you know, I think it, it was the case we used to use the phrase burnout, and you expected burnout for years and years of service. You know, and I think now, I think you 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 hear. Like, foundation trainees being running running ragged, you know, because in year one, they're kind of running the, the whole world. They're, it's their responsibility to run the whole world. So I think I think there is there is that sense of, you know, absolute responsibility without the joy that you get, get you know, of, of, of actually doing something and delivering something. And I think, and I guess that we have to try and reclaim both of those things that I think on the one hand, we clearly need the responsibility that, you know, we have to prove to our employers, to our regulators, et cetera, and then that's right and fair that, that that those public protection mechanisms are there. But then we also need to kind of make sure that we are able to re-inject the joy of actual clinical practice. You know, and I think I speak as someone who, who who has kind of worked outside, you know, I've been doing a lot of education, et cetera, and, you know, other roles. But as actually when you go and work as a clinician, that the ability that you can make a difference directly to someone else is, is, is really, really important. So maybe I haven't answered your question, but I think to me, I feel is that, if we start thinking in terms of changing system structures, et cetera, I think that may not necessarily resolve the, the issue. I think it is about all of us taking that individual responsibility, uh, um, whether we are patients, whether we are care, carers, whether we are managers. Because I know some in the chat, people have tried to kind of make this as a, as a, as a clinician versus manager issue. And I think that's wrong too. You know, I think, I think managers are in the same boat as us, you know, and I, I really find it deeply distressing when, when people start labeling managers as the as the villains and then the clinicians as the good guys, uh, I think health systems are complex. You know, everybody's trying to do a, a decent job. In my my opinion, there may be a few bad apples, and there are always going to be some bad apples. But by and large, everybody's trying to do a good job. I think is how do you retain that sense of you know empowerment that I can actually make a difference in a system that is not always designed to do that. And I think. That if we start with that process, then I think you know we, we can start chip away, chipping away at, at some of the things. But I think I, I don't think that it's about this functionalization model was wrong or that model was wrong. I mean, at least that's that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I I wonder what Debbie's views are. I think your daughter has been unwell for quite a long time, so I don't know whether whether you know she's sort of gone through the CMHT type model and then the the, the different sorts of um, model that exists now. What your experience of that is? That change has been. Yeah, I mean, so my daughter has a diagnosis of so-called personality disorder, but fundamentally she experiences a lot of trauma. Um, certainly um, that diagnosis her, changes the way she's spoken to, uh, treated, regarded, um, and that is a challenge. So, I mean, my daughter has been through every part of the, of the system from community mental health services right the way through to PQ, uh, specialist tier four services for personality disorders. So we've sort of done the A to Z of services really from that point of view. But no, I, I, I you know, I, I struggle with a lot of this conversation about disempowered practitioners. And um, if that's true, um, which if it is, then there's something fundamentally wrong with the whole training system, with the whole system itself. Um, if, if, you know, we're creating practitioners who who are feeling disempowered, who fundamentally, in my opinion, then seem to pass on their feelings of disempowerment to the patients because, um, and that's not okay because that person um, is, is struggling. They're, they're using services because they're, they're struggling with mental illness. And it's not even just excluding people um, at the bottom end from, from accessing services. You know, I've had experience with my daughter ringing crisis services saying that she's suicidal, being sent away, saying she's too distressed for them to speak to and that she should go away and calm down. I mean, what on earth is going on that we feel that that's OK to exclude people who are showing up, who are clearly distressed, who are reaching out for help and support 
and some version of a triage system is being used to move that person on, whether that be from, um, from community to inpatient, from acute inpatient to PQ. I mean, I mean, I can't even tell you the number of times my daughter's been moved around the country like a parcel because she doesn't fit within the risk category of one particular place or another. It's never about her, it's never about her needs um, and never has been. And some of the things that have been said to her are utterly appalling. Now she's been all over the country um, and maybe there are a few bad apples, but there are a few bad apples in a lot of different places if that's the case. And um, you know, I there are also some wonderful people who have been involved in her care and I don't want to be the one sitting here bashing people over the head because it doesn't help i'm not i don't want to be here throwing bricks um at, at clinicians because all that happens is clinicians throw bricks back and we don't move anything forward so if 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 we have a system where nobody feels that they have any power then who is responsible for that and if the royal college of psychiatrists have have influence and have power then then it needs to be used and it needs to be the people who someone has to have the power to do this because if and I have because I deliver a lot of training to, to people inpatient staff around participation and involvement and I've heard how disempowered staff feel and it makes me really sad to hear that they're trying to do something but they're not supported and there's this hierarchical system that means that everybody is in some way sort of squashing the person beneath them and it kills creativity it kills it kills compassion and yet there are models like open dialogue where they have a much more you know that flat a flat system of a more equal system where a psychiatrist is just one of a team of equals um where patients have a say a real say um where there's collaboration meaningful collaboration and and i feel that you know, patients and carers need to be involved in in delivering training and designing curriculums. It's not just about shared decision making about care. It's about changing the system. And the only way you're really going to I, mean, I know because I share my daughter's experience and she's very brave and stands up and shares her experience quite a lot. And when it does, people see things differently. And I think it's so important that people hear the reality of decisions that are made, of how it feels to be on the receiving end of a risk assessment, of how it feels to be on the receiving end of, um, you know, an, an inpatient admission. But this, you know, every, everybody blames everybody else. And I get really annoyed about it because I saw something pop up in the chat. You know, people are dying. My daughter's lost three friends in the space of a year who've taken their own life. Um, in inpatient units. Now, I'm not saying that risk can all, and that that can't always be avoided. I know that these things are not predictable, but I also know that mistakes have been made, and I nearly lost my own daughter to one of those mistakes. And yeah. uh, you know, again, I, I recognise that resources are limited, that patient, that, that staff are feeling stretched and unsupported. But that's not an excuse. It's not a good enough reason to not do anything. So, I that, yeah. yeah, sorry, I think that, that, that there's, I'm looking at the Q&A now and sort of seeing that actually there are quite a lot of questions or points around that, which is, you know, that there is a real tension between, uh, as someone says, the truths of the paper and also the limitations of the system, um, you know, in which we work. So, Chloe, oh, uh, how, I'm sorry, Clean, how do we um, how, how do we address this? How do you live with these tensions? You're right the first time. Um, I think, like I said, I keep coming back to honesty. Um, and I think that what happens, I mean, I'm sorry, I've heard Debbie speak about her experience and her daughter's experience a number of times now, and I absolutely never fail to be blown away um, and furious. Um, but I think what, yeah, what we're saying is that we, we can't as individuals or even as whole organizations suddenly create all of these resources and, and all of the money. And even if we did, there would be ridiculous criteria and ridiculous culture and practices and, and all that sort of thing. But honestly, because what happens is that we get frustrated and burnt out and furious with the fact that we can't provide our patients care, but then we start blaming the patient or 
kid ourselves because it's easier to live with the idea that actually what we're doing is the right thing. Otherwise, the cognitive dissonance is, is so destructive. Um, so we we fall into line. We kid ourselves and we say, well, actually, yes, um, we're not going to admit this person to hospital because we've quantified their risk as low or because uh, people with personality disorder get too dependent so they shouldn't be admitted or we're not going to offer this person psychological therapy because they once had some alcohol in 1973 so come back when you're sober you know whatever it is or you're too complicated or you're not complicated enough and what I feel now is that I'm not going to collude with this um, I will be furious and I am furious and I'm so fed up with being able to tell my patients that I can't offer them what they need but actually doing that is better and it's more honest and it's better for the patients as well it's better for therapeutic relationships and you know to be honest about what's going on so I'm not going to tell somebody that they that it's completely appropriate to deny them care um, I'm not going to tell somebody that I'm that they're not going to get into this service because of really good clinical reasons I'm not going to tell someone that they're you know that they're not sick enough to deserve help for their eating disorder or at the other end of the eating disorder spectrum that they're at death's door but they're the wrong type of complex to receive help for their eating disorder you know and I'm not being flippant about any of this this is my life this is my day-to-day -day clinical life and I'm not going to collude with it um and I think that that in itself is I think it's a useful thing to do because at least people will see us being honest about the limitations and why we can't give them this, but this is what we are gonna try and do. Otherwise the problem gets firmly put back to the patient. If you were the right sort of person, if you were less annoying or less difficult or less complicated or less whatever, you'd get the help, um, but you're not fitting the right boxes. So go away and come back when you're a little bit more compliant to our system. So it's, it's not a solution as such, but I think it's the start. It's just that honesty. Um, stop pretending that this is that this is OK. So, but I think people are sort of commenting about, you know, the Royal College and what's the Royal College's role in all of this. So I, th I think you're the best person to answer that. Yeah, I'm, well, Debbie, you know, I mean, um, it, it's always heartbreaking to hear any any story of, and, and I think we know that there are there are numerous such examples, and each one is one too many. And I think um, so. I wasn't suggesting that um, clinicians' disempowerment should become an excuse to do nothing. Not at all. I mean, I, I I think we need to acknowledge what the real problems are. And I think, like you, I've done a lot of training, and you know, we've been running a. A, a, a group of expert patient educators. And I think every day is a new learning experience for me. So I think first thing for me, I think is to get away from that us and them thing. I think, you know, just because I talk about person-centered care doesn't mean that I'm a person-centered care practitioner at all times. You know, I think there are days and, and times when I, I get it wrong and I'm sure Chloe, the same happens to you, you know, I think, and that's the reality of, of our working. And I think, I guess, so I, I really don't want us to see this as an us and them thing. I think it's about creating an environment where we can support each other and then talk about these things openly. And I think that does actually mean taking that individual responsibility, but that also means for me as a Dean, I think that talking about what can the college do is making sure that these elements are introduced in the curriculum. You know, So I, like you talk about the power differential, but also about speaking up. You know, If we don't speak up for our patients, who will? And, and, and if some of us, don't feel empowered to speak, then we need to learn to feel, to be empowered to speak speak up, you know. I think it's not okay for us to not speak up for our patients. I think, uh, and then so, so for, for me, I think those are the elements that I think we should be doing. But there are other things that we need to do. And I think I wasn't suggesting that there's nothing in the system that we can't change. I think we know, for example, that, um, uh, you know, in the 24 hours prior to admission, people have number of number of assessments, you know. And, and I think they just go through that assessment cycle without, always there's assessments always adding value nothing you know i think we have sometimes within the same organization different parts of the service operating like fortresses is the word that you use i think chloe in your article and and i think we need to look at that you know and i think about well, why do we not have those trusted assessments why do people need you know how is that next assessment adding value apart from just gatekeeping and i guess and i guess if and i've seen a lot of people talking about values based uh 
uh, practice. And I think if we start bringing those values right to the heart and center of our design of pathways, because right now our pathways are designed in such a way to incentivize that fortress mentality, isn't it? If your key performance indicators or whatever are your performance indicators that that whichever organization is using, whether it's CQC or whether it's your own 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 employer or whoever rewards you for being that fortress, then obviously I think you know however hard you try to fight against it, it is going to be hard for you to do that. And I think nothing. I, I guess that's where I see a lot of my colleagues, and, and this is not just doctors; it's us all clinicians. Uh, however, if we all had a stake in the entire pathway, I think things would be different, right? I think nothing. And, and I said, I, and I saw. I hope that you know. I know there are many medical directors in in the room today. Uh, and in terms of talking of power, you know, I think power is so disparate. You know, I think I think people think of college is powerful. Uh, some people think of NHS England is powerful. The Department of Health. I, I don't know where the where. I think we all of us have responsibility. But I certainly feel. I hope that people who have more direct, um, you know, contact with design of services. I think we should be looking at this. How do we manage those interfaces? How do we make sure that all of us have a stake in the entire pathway rather than just the narrow bit that we are directly involved in? Because ultimately, you know, if you start seeing people as a whole, then that entire pathway, that entire journey matters, you know, it matters to all of us. And, and, and I guess that's why, Chloe, you feel furious. And that's why, Debbie, you felt so, so, so let down by the system, you know? And I think, I, I, and, I, and, you know, I, I can see that, you know, there are 15, well, hundreds of people saying that they don't want to feel that way. They clearly don't want to feel that way. So I, I, I feel that we are, we need to be devising the solutions, you know, and I think, I think a lot of this is about the system design, but how do, because I think often the answer to a lot of these kind of problems is let's, let's design a new service that will somehow solve all these problems. And I, I genuinely don't feel that that is the answer, you know, and I think, and I, I really feel the answer is about us having more ownership of the entire pathway. Uh, and then thinking about, well, how do I, how am I, I personally adding value? How is my service adding value in this pathway? So uh, it, it might sound like a not very concrete step, but I actually feel that this is the kind of conversation now system designers need to be having. And a key element of that is co-production. And I think certainly for me, I think in terms of our training pathways, that is very much an integral part of where we are at now. Thanks very much. Um, I, I, you know, not another sort of theme that's come up in some of the questions and the, that uh, certainly um, came through in the paper um, is about the capacity, uh, uh, Mental Capacity Act, sort of being used as a sort of tool for exclusion. I mean, I, I, I can see I can see the argument there, but then on the other hand, you know, the sort of the autonomy and the principle of autonomy is so important in medicine and sort of to Western societies. I mean, do do you see that there is a tension there? Um, I don't know who's going to answer that. Maybe Cleo, Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible with Um, I I don't know that there is as much of a tension as it might seem actually and and, the, and I'm very interested in the mental capacity act and I think that it's not so much the mental capacity act itself that is uh used to justify exclusion it's something that people have latched onto as a, a misinterpretation and I specifically speak a lot about the sort of emerging and really disturbing practice of people being told that they have capacity to kill themselves therefore are not being offered help um, and it, it's actually it's it's it is a really important argument because it's it, I believe it's one of the reasons why we're not in England and Wales with the Mental Health Act review at the moment going to move forward with the idea of um, fusion law, which has been adopted in Northern Ireland. Um, and a lot of people, I think, fed back to the review that actually the concern was that this idea would where well, you've got capacity, so we don't need to help you. Um, is very worrying. So a mental health act that was then based on sort of entirely capacity based um, really risks uh, uh, that exclusion. But, but of course, we also do have this tension, I suppose, in that traditionally, and again, the focus of the mental health act review is that we've been overly coercive. Um, but it just feels to me that we fail at every, you know, at every juncture at, at, at both ends of the spectrum, we sort of see that either we prevent risk from happening by coercing people or we pretend risk isn't happening by excluding them um so i don't 
I don't know that it's so much attention. I think it's it's more the fact that we're not, I, I think as a profession, and not just in psychiatry, actually, you know, I think in the, the medical profession, the health profession, I think that we just can't really be trusted to use the legislation properly, frankly. You know, the Mental Capacity Act is massively, you know, not, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, try, trying to sort of speak diplomatically, but it's, it's not used well. It, it's not well understood. It's not properly taught. It's not taken seriously. Um, I am... Um, Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. I, 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 I think I'm getting your uh, your message. Um, now you've got a minute each, uh, Subodh and Debbie, to to say your comment on the Mental Capacity Act. Is it you? Is it exclusionary? Are we you, are we misusing it um, or or not? Sorry, you will need to be brief. Um, I mean, I'm no expert on it because I don't need to be, but I have seen the consequences of it, I suppose, and I guess. Yeah. Um, what I do know is that those who, I mean, not so much, yeah, I suppose those, the whole system, um, I, I don't know, I, I don't know enough, my daughter is always so-called, has deemed to be, have capacity and therefore I, I can't really comment about that, there are lots of other things I, I would like to have said, but, um, you know, that's, that's not an area that I feel able to really comment on, but what I do know is that the system generally in terms of coercion does seem to try and socialise patients to be um, compliant and behave in a certain way, and I think anything that is misused in some way to to, to exclude or to, to coerce, you know, it's, it's again that power, power differential and, and how that is used. And I think um, where there is such a massive power differential, there is always an, a, a possibility for abuse in some way, for that to be abused rather than abused. Subod, I know you have philosophical interests, so I guess the Mental Capacity Act might fall. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, it's, it's obviously a very wide ranging discussion, but I think, I think the narrow point at other times when people have kind of used the phrase, I think, in, in the article that Chloe says that it has capacity to go and harm themselves or something like that. I mean, I can't remember the exact phrase, but I'm sure people have done that. And I, I think the central point here is that is that, you know, I think I think what is our role as clinicians? And I think, I think sometimes it's, if you forget that it's is to care for people. And I think and when we care for people, I think I think we can, the caring element is, is is quite important. You know, and I think I think I think what does that mean? And I think I think this comes up. This discussion has come up because and again, it's not just psychiatrists. I mean, I I, I do teaching in the acute hospital, and then you know, emergency med, medicine trainees are really exercised about this. They really worry about, it. and I, and I and I, I do feel that people actually worry about misusing it. Not not deliberately, but inadvertently, not knowing how to use it, uh, and and then where, where, where do the boundaries lie? And, and the reality is, that there's a real tension there, isn't it, between someone? And I think you you describe the tension, Chloe, and I think yeah, Debbie, you must have you know seen this. And the people when come in, they don't come with very neat categorization of what they want to do with their lives, right? It's not as if they always know what. And I think it's our job as clinicians to explore that and to work with them, and and then to fit people into neat categories is not always easy around. around. And I think. Uh, and I think that's where the guidance and the and the values that are 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 underpinning the legislative frameworks like mental capacity act and mental health act come into play. I think they both those log documents talk about you know autonomy, talk about compassion, talk about you know least restrictive practice, and talk about ultimately you know I think effective and equ equitable practice. And I think that is important. You know I think I think and I think now all of these things can sound very philosophical. But in reality, when you start breaking down and just making a decision about someone, then you might think that, well, actually, it might not be, well, what is equitable here? Is it okay to admit them, not okay to admit them? You, you need to have conversations with people and then work it out. Sure. So I think um, caring is important. Thanks, Yuba. I can see that there's loads and loads of comments about things like um, moral injury, and we've not really managed to explore the moral injury side of things. We've also had lots of questions and comments about the organisational response uh, for, for you, um, in particular, uh, Chloe, but also, um, you know, how, how, how do, how do, Sorry, how do um, organisations respond to this? But it is going to end exactly on time. And so I'm going to draw it all to a close. 
the um, the panelists will answer the questions though, so um, they'll, they'll be responding to these later and hopefully you will receive uh, some comments back. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much to the panelists. Bye-bye.